All right, this is going to be a little different approach to how to TIG weld aluminum. I'm going to try to cover a lot of things that I normally skip over. I don't skip over them on purpose, but I just that's just the way it works sometimes. So I'll let the comments dictate uh, a lot of what comes in the next video. This will be a series. How to TIG weld aluminum. It will also show some how not to TIG weld aluminum. Let's, let's go ahead and run a bead, and uh, that will be the launching pad. It used to be that we would round the tip of the electrode for welding aluminum, but now with inverter power sources, it's common to leave a taper on there just like this, just about like you would for steel, and just let the electrode ball as it will. That's pretty much what I do. I'll be doing a little bit of welding with uh, transformers today as well. All right, you see that big frosty looking area? That is a, called a cleaning action. We'll just explain exactly how that happens a little bit later. Let's, let's break it down a little bit slower now. We light up the arc and immediately we start to see stuff cook away. And then we get this little area here that's kind of like sort of frosty looking. And then we get this area that's shiny and wet looking. That's the puddle. You don't add rod until you get that shiny wet puddle. Let's talk about why we weld aluminum on alternating current. The main property of aluminum that, that requires us to weld it on alternating current is the fact that it's got an oxide film on it. A good example of what that is like is let's picture a peel coat that comes on a lot of polished metal like this. Picture that peel coat and imagine that that peel coat melted at 3600 degrees where the, where the metal under it only melted at about 1200 degrees. You'd have some problems there. You'd have to have a way of breaking through that peel coat. And DCEN, the way we weld steels, won't do it. It, it, it's great for pinpointing heat. The current flows from negative to positive and it pinpoints heat like this on steel. That's how we weld carbon steel and stainless steel, nickel alloys, titanium, and a lot of other stuff. But it doesn't do anything to break up that aluminum oxide. So I'm going to run a bead here using that sharpened electrode and using DCEN with straight argon on aluminum. And you can see it's just not working out all that well. I've got it slowed down here and you can see it's just I'm trying to punch through a scummy film on the surface and it is looking like Fido's butt. Now a quick polish reveals all kinds of little holes and porosities in there. Alright, let's take a look now at DCEP. Now, this is going to get crazy, but we get one good thing out of DCEP where the current is flowing in the reverse direction. That's why they call it reverse polarity. We get one good thing out of that and that is cleaning action. It does break up the aluminum oxide that's on the surface. But the electrode gets really hot because the, the, the heat flow is going up through the electrode. Attention to that sharp tip as soon as I light up here. I'm only going to get up to about 25 amps. All that cleaning action is good, but it just, it's just an unstable arc. Tip of the electrode is getting super hot. Arc is wandering everywhere. When I get it up even anywhere between 25 and 30 amps, the tip of that electro just quivers. It's getting so hot. And if I if I go much hotter than that, I'm going to dump a big ball of electrode into the puddle. And that's not good. See the big ball on the end there? Uh, that's a different bead, but you get the point. Now, AC, alternating current, you get a mix of the two, and it's alternating back and forth. It's alternating between EP and EN. And so you get you get the good properties, you get good heat input, and you get the cleaning action, but you don't get too much heating of the electrode to make it impractical. Now this puddles almost right away. I've got it set at about 70 or 75 amps. You can see I'm maintaining a nice taper on the electrode. It's a nice stable arc. And it barely rounded on the tip. That's a benefit of the newer inverter machines. All right, I'm going to run a bunch of beads here just give you a bunch of different looks and just talk about some things because again I want to generate some questions. So there I light up. I'm only at 1 amp per 1000s here. I set it at 63 amps and I'm welding on 063 material. And you can see the travel speed is eh, fairly slow. I had to wait around about three or four seconds to get things going. So I bumped the amperage up just a little bit. 75 amps. I can get started and get moving out a lot quicker. I've set a, a cheap Harbor Freight square up next to the bead so you can get an idea of the travel speed. That's a good use for a Harbor Freight square. Because it probably, if I do several beads like that, it'll probably heat the square up and warp it. There's lots of things we could talk about here. Arc length, torch angle, 
type of cup I'm using, the flow of gas I'm using, the type of gas I'm using, the type of electrode, the diameter of the electrode. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for the questions in the comments for this video to address all those things. All right, that's a five-inch long bead. I timed it, and uh, even though it seemed longer, it took 30 seconds. So that's 10 inches per minute of travel speed. I got my Duresta ice pick I ordered from Jimmy Duresta. And incidentally, he was our most recent special guest on the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast that aired on March 13th. I'm using the ice pick here to scribe lines so that I, I can see where I'm going to uh, help me make this video. Here I'm going to run two, inch, two inches using the foot pedal. I'm going to try to show you the foot pedal. See me light up. I barely tap the foot pedal, get the arc going, huddle the very end. Barely got any foot pedal going after three or four dips. And then I start mashing the pedal down gradually until I'm full pedal. And I'm, I'm full pedal here at about 70 amps on 063 material. And when I get about two or three dips from the end, I start letting off until I'm all the way off. And you can replay that if, you're, if you uh, take a notion to. Let's look at some joints now. One of the most popular is outside corner joint. Great for making some kind of drip pan or a tray or something like that. It's one of the easier joints. You can make them look really nice and you can actually hold a lot longer arc than you can get away with on a lot of other joints. Let's look at a butt joint now. This is a butt joint in the uh, same thickness I was welding earlier, 063. That's 1.6 millimeter. I know it looks a lot bigger, but I've got it zoomed in. Let's look at lap joints. I'm, us I'm using this old Lincoln transformer machine here. You can hear a difference. This is 60 hertz. I've got just a little bit of helium mixed in, and it's really a nice arc. Inside corner joint. It's just about the same as a T-joint, unless you happen to have some gap or something. You keep a tight arc, and you just move the puddle ahead and dab, and move the puddle ahead and dab, and you try to do it in a mechanized fashion. All right, let's look at a T-joint, which is going to look almost the same, except pay attention to the very beginning of this. I light up, and I try to get that, keep that puddle small. Tight arc, dab rod, get it joined, pause for just a minute, let the heat dissipate a little bit, and then get to moving. It's all about a good tight arc and not too much torch angle. I think I'm using a number five or a number six Pyrex cup on there. Just mainly for helping film the video, it, it seems to help. Cast aluminum really illustrates the need for cleaning action that we showed earlier, the cleaning action of the AC arc. And so because castings have more oxidation and sometimes even have oil impregnated, I will let that cleaning action work a little bit before I ever puddle. Run it back and forth a little bit before I ever start adding rod and puddling, and that seems to work for me. And I just coaxed, coaxed the bead on, kind of like a braze joint. Let's briefly talk about how not to TIG, and I'm just really going to show one example of the main thing that beginners seem to do wrong, and that's too long an arc. That big arc plume caused by the long arc causes the rod, causes the rod to melt before it gets into the puddle. It causes too big a puddle. It's hard to neck it down once it gets this big. There's porosity showing its ugly head. It's not getting into the root of the joint. We've got lack of fusion. That's that with just tightening the arc up and look how much better things are going. Okay, well that's a good start. That's plenty of content to generate plenty of questions in the comments section. And that's, that's what's going to dictate the direction we take. I mean, it's a good start, but I want to go deeper. So if you got a question, please leave it below. And before I let you go, I want to let you, I want to let you know that I have the 2016 DVD set ready and up for sale at my online store at weldmonger.com. At the end of each year, I take the, the videos and have my son Jake put them on a four disc DVD set. And I put them up for sale at my online store, weldmonger.com. That's how, that's how I pay the bills. That's how I buy metal and gases and, and support these videos. So here's a quick sample of what you can expect to see on that set. This is a uh, TIG welding aluminum. You've already seen this shot on this particular video, as well as this one. TIG welding some carbon steel at about 170 amps. Some 7018 uphill T joint multi pass, dual shield flux core 3G and 4G tests, 6G pipe test, the 6010 root, 7018 fill and cap, 2 inch schedule 80, 
and some dual shield flux core with JD. All right, here's what the set looks like. It's indexed on the back, four discs in a nice case. So if that makes sense for you, uh, if you if you want to up your welding game and you want to invest in yourself, head over to weldmonger.com. We'll see you next time.